I want to talk about this conflicts between now and later. How do we deal with this issue when we have something that is good for us now and how do we deal with something that is good for us later? Um, these questions of now versus later are, are everywhere, but for me the, the time when it came kind of to the focus with the highest degree uh, was quite a few years ago. Um, when I was in hospital many, many years ago, I got a bad blood transfusion. And as a consequence, I got a liver disease, and for a long time, I had all kinds of flare-ups with my liver. And it was bad enough to be in hospital, it was worse to get a, a liver disease. And they didn't know what it was. They tried all kinds of treatment, but nothing worked. And about seven years after I was originally injured, I was already out of the hospital, I had another flare-up, I checked myself into hospital, and they told me I had hepatitis C. By that time, they could identify the virus, and they knew what I had. And there was a treatment by the FDA. There was this proposal that this new medication called interferon might work for hepatitis C. Interferon was originally approved for hairy cell leukemia, and they were wondering whether it would work for hepatitis C. So they asked me if I want to go on this medical experiment to see whether it would work. And I said, what happened if I don't? And they described what it means like to die from liver cirrhosis. And I said, OK, I'll do the, the experimental treatment. And they gave me these injections I had to take for three times a week for a year and a half. And each one of those injections were quite miserable. After each of them, I got sick for about 14 hours. Headache, vomiting, fever, fever shaking, stuff like that. Not as bad as liver cirrhosis, but for sure and now. So imagine you were in this situation. Imagine that you had a potentially very terrible disease. And if you take your injections now, you might not be sick in 30 years, but for sure you'll have miserable 15 hours. Would you do it to yourself? And actually, when you reflect on this, this is, of course, is a central problem in, in human life. Uh, this is what we, what we think of as the Adam and Eve problem. When I think about Adam and Eve. Who would ever give up eternity in the Garden of Eden for an apple? What kind of a strange trade-off? It turns out we do this every day. So just consult your own... Uh, Behavior for a second. How many people here this week have eaten more than you hoped you would? Okay. How many people have exercised less than you thought you should? Okay. How many people have texted while driving? I know in New York you don't drive a lot. <coughs> How many people think you could text while driving if you were driving? <laughs> How many people would save less than you thought you should? Spend more money than you should. Have more unprotected sex than you should. <laughs> Nobody. That's very good. <laughs> so on many of those activities, aside from one, you report to not doing that, that well. Um, and if you think about it, this is a very basic problem that we have in our lives. There are things that are good in principle in the future, and there's things that are good now in the present, and they're not the same, and in fact, in their contradicting each other very often. So consider the following framing. Imagine I said, what would you rather have? Half a box of chocolate now or a full box of chocolate in a week? And imagine I passed the chocolate around. So you could see it and you could smell it. It was just here. And you had the choice between half a box of chocolate now or a full box in a week. How many people here would wait another week for another half a box of chocolate? OK, few souls. And I assure you that if we actually pass the chocolate around, there will be fewer of you. But most, people, but most people say, give me the half a box of chocolate. Now, few people say, give me the full box in a week. Imagine I, choose, I push the choice of the future. And I say, what would you rather have? Half a box of chocolate in a year or a full box of chocolate in a year and a week? And I realize it's the same exact trade-off. Because the question is, would you wait another week for another, box of, another half a box of chocolate? But how many people would wait now? Right? Everybody. Why? Because we're in the future. We are wonderful people. Right? <laughs> we will exercise. We will diet. We will save. We will not text while driving. In the future, we are wonderful people. The problem is we don't get to live in that future. We get to live in the present. And in the present, we fail to temptation over and over. Anyway, fast forward a year and a half, I took this medication. 
uh, I beat the disease. I was cured. That was good news. The medication was approved by the FDA. That was also good news. And they also told me I was the only patient in this protocol that took the medication on time, every time. And the question is why? Do I have better self-control? Do I think better about the future? The answer is none of those. The answer is that I love movies. And what I did was on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which were injection day, I would first thing in the morning go to a video store. I would rent a few videos I really wanted to watch. I would carry them in my backpack the whole day anticipating watching them. I would get home, I would put the video in, I would give myself the injection, I would get a bucket and a blanket for the side effect, and I would press play. I did not wait for the side effects to start. I basically connected something unpleasant, the injection, with something good, which was the movies. Now, if you think about it, this is kind of a strange idea. Because if you actually asked what's important in life, livers would be quite high up there. <laughs> And because livers are so important, me and all the other patients should have taken our medication on time all the time. But the problem is that even though livers are much more important than injection, this is how not, not how we view things. There's also the time domain. And the effect of the liver is really far in the future. It might take 20, 30 years for the effect of the liver to settle in. And because of that, it looms much smaller. And the effect of the injections are now, so it's much, much bigger. But if you think of my equation, my equation was injection for movies. There was not any mention of flavors. I did what we call reward substitution. The idea is that I stopped caring about my liver, and I started thinking about movies. Now, if you think about it more generally, there's lots of problems like that. There's a lot of problems that we are just not designed to care about as human beings. Think about global warming. Can we get people to wake up in the morning and care about global warming? Very tough, very tough to think so. In fact, if you went about it the other way, and you say, let's design a problem that would maximize human apathy, <laughs> yeah? you would probably come up with global warming. <laughs> right? Think about all the elements long in the future, would happen to other people first. We don't see it progressing. We don't see anybody suffering. And anything we would do is a drop in the bucket. Each of those forces separately cause us to be apathic. And you put them together, they all combine in global warming. So can we get people to wake up in the morning and feel energized about doing something about the environment? Very unlikely. You know, Maybe a couple of fanatics here and there. But for the majority, it's going to be incredibly hard. But can we use reward substitution? Can we use other things from the broad range of human motivation and get people to behave as if they care about global warming? I think one example for that is the Toyota Prius. My own uh, informal data analysis is that when I drive around and I see people in Toyota Priuses, they look to me like they smile more than other people. <laughs> right? And I think for good reason, because they drive in the Toyota Prius and they say, look at me, I'm a wonderful human being. <laughs> And not only am I a wonderful human being, other people can recognize it and can see that I'm a wonderful human being because my car looks so different. Right? What about other things like the temperature in our house or the boiler that we use or the um, other things that we have in terms of insulation in our attic? All of those things don't allow us to express something like our pride or our ego. But what if we started doing it? What if we thought seriously about reward substitution and we say people don't care naturally about all kinds of things Let's link those to other things like ego, like pride, that would get people to behave as if they care. Turns out there's lots of problems like that. You can think about how we deal with overeating and how do we deal with medical compliance, how do we deal with global warming. With all of those, you could say, let's attack the problem heads on, which is unlikely to be successful. Or you could say, let's create some other reward that people would focus on that reward and therefore behave as if they care. So this was the first approach to overcome problem self-control, reward substitution. The second type of solution I want to talk to you about is called self-control contracts. And this, goes, this story goes back to the story of Ulysses and the sirens. And if you remember the story, the story is Ulysses knew that if the sirens will come, he will be tempted. So he asked the sailors to tie him to the mast. And he asked the sailors to put Donag in their ears, so even when the sirens will come, he will not be able to follow on his temptation. If you think about it, that's a very interesting mechanism. 
It's basically saying that we know that we will be tempted. So we are willing to do something to prevent ourselves from being able to fail. Would we do that? So before we think about people, I want to tell you a little bit about rats and pigeons. <laughs> so imagine you're either a rat or a pigeon. You can choose. And I teach you for a very long time that if you see a green button and you press on it, one second passes and you get one pellet of food. And if you see a purple button and you press on it, you have to wait 10 seconds, and then you get 10 pellets of food. And you learn this for a very long time until it's very clear to you what's green and what's purple. And then all of a sudden, I put them together. And I say, what do you want, green or purple? And just so you realize, 10 seconds for a rat is like a week for us. It's a really long time. So what do you think they do when you give them this choice one next to each other? Do they have the patience to work, wait for the purple button? No. They choose for green. They get one pellet of food. They forgo the 10. It actually gets slightly worse. The trial starts. The purple button appears. The rat or the pigeon press on the purple button. A second passes. Then the green button appears. If they could just hold off and not press on anything, in nine seconds they will get 10 pellets of food. But can they hold off? No. They succumb to temptation. They press the green button. They get one pellet of food and forgo the 10 pellets of food. Here's the most interesting version. The trial starts, the purple button comes, they press on it, a second passes, and the red button comes. And the red button is not connected to food. And rats and pigeons don't enjoy pressing buttons. <laughs> but if they press on this red button, the green button will not show up. This is the Ulysses contract. This is kind of the rat or pigeon saying to themselves, I can exert effort here. I can do something I don't like, but it will prevent me from being tempted in the future. So what do you think? Would rats and pigeons be insightful and uh, have enough intuition to press the red button? Hard to imagine, but they do. Not all the time, but they do. And I think this is incredibly optimistic. Because first of all, if they can do it, maybe we can do it too. But the second thing is it's all about including red buttons. If you take a rat or a pigeon and you face them to temptation, they will fail. By the way, the same thing works for us. If you, we're going to do an experiment after this session is over. There's wine and cheese and uh, some other food out there. And I'll see how well you could be tempted. Um, when we are tempted with anything that is uh, good for us in the short term but not good in the long term, there's a good chance we would fail. But what if we created red buttons? What if we created this mechanism that basically eliminate temptation for coming our way? Would we be able to overcome temptation? I'll show you a couple of those examples. This is a, an alarm clock designed one of the students in the, by one of the students in the Media Lab. It's called Clocky. And Clocky is a clock with two big wheels that run in slightly different speeds. Now, when you go to sleep at night and you set up the alarm clock to go up at 6 o'clock in the morning, in your mind, you're the kind of person who wakes up early and goes for a run before you go to work. <coughs> and then 6 o'clock in the morning runs along, and you are no longer that person. <laughs> you're the kind of person that stays in bed a little longer and barely make it to the office on time. But if you have clocky, clocky starts running around the room <laughs> in unpredictable ways, making noise, running around. And by the time you find it, you have to get up. You have to crawl under furniture. You have to find it. By the time you find it, you're awake. By the way, one of the interesting design flaws of Clocky is that by the time you find Clocky, you're also very pissed. <laughs> so there's lots of pictures on the web of Clocky with wheels torn off. <laughs> um, but there's a new version of Clocky under development with no moving parts, so you can't, uh, you can't uh, destroy it. <laughs> Another version I like even more is an alarm clock called Snooze and Lose. And it's an alarm clock that is connected to your bank account. <laughs> and to a charity you hate. <laughs> right? Now, think about the alarm clock going up, the alarm clock going up in the morning, and let's say you set it up for a charity you like, like giving money for trees. Now you can snooze and even feel good about yourself. You're helping the world somehow. But if it's a charity you hate, think about your most hated politician. 
If it's a charity you hate, there's no way to snooze. There's no way for you to close your eyes and be restful. There's a website called Stick, designed by two chubby economists. And these two chubby economists discovered that losing weight is really hard. So what they did was they bet against each other lots of money. And they said, if we don't lose a particular amount of weight, the other person would get all this money. Now, when you do these bets, you can't bet with somebody you like. Because let's say you bet with your mother, and you lose lots of half of your yearly income. Your mother is not going to take your money. You have to bet with somebody that you know will take your money. So you have to bet with somebody who's not really a good friend of yours that would be OK actually seeing you suffering. <laughs> and STICK allows people to basically create contracts against ourselves. Many of my students use this to create contracts against seeing, uh, using Facebook too often. There's lots of things like that that this is helpful in terms of regulating our behavior. I'll tell you one, uh, one last story about this. There was a program in Denver called the Denver Drug Program. And this was a program that approached heroin addicts. They approached heroin addicts and they asked them, do you want to be a heroin addict? And most people say no. The life of a heroin addict is not a particularly good, good life. And then they offer these people a deal. They say, hey, why don't you write a letter, a self-incriminating letter about your drug pro problem? And please address this letter to the person you fear most will find out about your drug addiction. So in my case, I would write a letter to my mother. I would say, dear mom, I'm really sorry to tell you. I have a heroin habit. Love, Dan. <laughs> and then this organization will take the letter. They would fold it. They would put it in an envelope. They would write the address. They would put a stamp, but they would hold it in trust. And they would come from time to time, and they would check whether I have any residues of heroin in my blood. And if I ever had any residue, they will mail the letter away. Now think about what this mechanism is. It's about creating a punishment that is so big that hopefully even in moments of craving, it would control people's behavior. In a moment of clarity, when people don't want to be heroin addicts, they can basically create these mechanisms. And then the question is, will that mechanism control them when they're in craving? So what do you think happened when people got into drug craving? They went to this organization that we want out. And this organization said, fine, in three weeks. But now we know your craving, and we will test your blood every day. Right? So if you think about it, this is an incredibly powerful mechanism. Right? This is the idea that we can create a punishment that is so big that even later on, when we're tempted, we will not be able to act on our temptation. But they, by the way, eventually they had to cancel this program, mostly because of violation of human rights. Because you can see how these mechanisms are actually kind of tricky in terms of human freedom. How do we think about a mechanism that its only way of effectiveness is to be so powerful that it's big and strong, and the only, benef the only way to get it is so people cannot change their mind afterward? We recently, by the way, tried another version of those things. It turns out in the history of mankind, no men have ever woken up in the morning and say, today, I feel like colonoscopy. <laughs> So what do you think men do on the days when they have colonoscopy scheduled? They don't show up. They find other things to do. So we said, what if we allow people, when you schedule for them a colonoscopy, way in advance, you say, why don't you write us a check for $500? And if you show up on time, we'll give you the money back. And if you don't show up on time, you lose the money. Now, this is a, an offer that people can, at best, lose nothing, or they can lose. There's no way to win anything here. But more than 50% of the people take that. Why? Because we know that when we will wake up four months in the future, we would not feel like colonoscopy. But we also know that we will not feel like losing our money. And maybe if we put enough money down, that fear and annoyance of not losing money would actually force us to behave in a way that is good for our long-term well-being. So what is the general point? The general point is that we have lots of Adam and Eve problems. And by the way, we're only getting more of those. There was a recent analysis that asked the question of why people die and what percentage of these mortalities are caused by bad decision making. And about 100 years ago, the percent of deaths that you could attribute to bad decision making was about 10%. Think about 100 years ago, what mistakes people could make that would kill themselves. You push a rock on yourself, I mean, all kinds of things like that. In 2007, it was about 45%. Why? Because as we invent new technologies, we also invent ways to kill ourselves. Right? 
smoking, diabetes, obesity, texting while driving. Think about all the things that basically we create that tempts us to behave badly. Driving. And all of a sudden, when we have one deviation from it, it can have tremendous devastation. And you know what? The nature of technology is technology is going to become more and more tempting, not less and less tempting. What do you think is going to be the next version of the donut? Is it going to be a less tempting donut or a more tempting donut? Probably a more tempting donut. What do you think is going to be the next version of Facebook? Is it going to tempt us to visit Facebook more frequently or less frequently? Probably more frequently. All the, situ all, all the commercial world around us wants our time, our attention, our effort, our money right now. And because of that, we need more and more ability to self-control, and we have less and less of it. So we have lots of Adam and Eve problems, and we're just going to have more of them with time. And in principle, it would be nice if each of us could come up with our own Ulysses solutions. If for each area of our life, when we face temptation, we could come up with it. Sadly, this is not that easy. Uh, but thankfully, there are ways to do it. I think there's all kinds of opportunities for uh, hardware, like alarm clocks, and software, like stick, and all kinds of mechanisms that basically understand where we fail from temptation and try to help us a little bit overcome these temptations. And, and I think if we do that, if we actually think about where we fail, there's a good way to think about how we overcome these temptations. But the first step is really to understand how we fail. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. You're on.